Glory to God. What a joy to be home again. Even though you didn't get a little perky before your turkey, as you normally get for Thanksgiving, there is Christmas coming, so you're still getting a little perky before your turkey. <laughs> so good to be with all of our friends, and we love this house. We have uh, walked the journey with this house for 20 years. We first arrived in 1998, and a revival broke out. And two weeks later, we were still in revival in this house. And um, started out with revival. It's come full circle to one of the greatest outpourings that I believe this nation will ever see. And it's just beginning. It's just beginning. Amen. I want to honor a couple of people today, always. I want to honor Pastor Norman Owens, who in my books is one of the finest men I've ever known in my life. Come on, tell the Lord you appreciate. I called him dad, so, but I honor Brother Owens today. A lot of you don't, there's a lot of things you, you don't know about this relationship, but over 20 years ago, before we ever started coming here, we were preaching revivals for Brother and Sister Owens in Odessa, Texas. And I'll never forget, in one of our revivals, we were having lunch together, and he leaned over and he said, you need to preach for my son, Paul. He said, in fact, let me call him now. <laughs> and we were sitting there eating lunch, and we called, and we connected, and... And uh, here we are, 20 years later. I want to uh, thank uh, Pastor Paul and Pastor Kim Owens for a friendship that just has spanned such a long period of time, and yet through thick and thin, nothing has ever splintered this special covenant relationship. We've walked through some fun <laughs> times together. We've, we've laughed. We've also cried. And we've helped and strengthened one another in many different seasons of our lives, our families, and our ministries. I remember the first time we came, Jessica was 10 years old. For me to sit and watch her and David and this team, you just got to understand something here. You got to understand that you go back that far in someone's life and you watch the journey and that prophetic anointing, that sound that has been deposited in this church and in this team through their leadership. You've just got to understand, I'm a daddy at heart, and she's like a daughter to me. And I'm thankful. When I saw these children, I said, Lord, that's what my parents gave me. They deposited this thing called revival in me at an early age. And I've never been satisfied with anything short of it. I've seen a lot of fakery. I've seen a lot of the spirit of goofiness. But what I've been in this weekend is absolutely pure fire. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this time. I want to thank uh, Apostle Ryan and Joy for your ministry. I am so grateful for your ministry. You're a blessing to the kingdom of God. And I have just been so blessed. I can't wait for tonight. I've, I've even got a reserved seat for this deal. I'm, I'm excited. I want to thank you all for your partnership over these 20 years. We just concluded our 82nd Overseas Crusade. And as soon as Christmas is over, I want you to pray with us and decree a, a breakthrough anointing over the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. It is my latest assignment. I have linked, we have linked our shields and partnered with missionaries there to establish a Holy Ghost filled fire baptized international church. Prague is one of the most bound up cities I'd have ever been to in Europe. And we minister in 22 European nations. Prague is 92% atheist. And that devil is coming down. That devil is being cast out. And there's a powerful anointing coming to the city of Prague. And uh, I am so excited about it. So when you pray for us, if you think about us, at all between our times, uh, decree that with me because I, I've seen and uh, I know the strongholds that are over the city. 
Also, right after that, we will be doing two weeks revival at two international churches in Madrid, in the great country of Spain. And it just continues. I, I've asked the Lord to give me a hundred crusades at least before he would be finished with me. And I'm so thankful that he has given my voice. And I am so thankful that message last night. He has given us a voice. I am also uh, grateful today for the best friend I have. Don't worry, I'll take this off my preaching time. It won't affect a thing. <laughs> After 36 years, we'll still be able to flow. Don't worry. It's not our first rodeo. I'm so thankful for my very best friend. And uh, December the 26th, the day after Christmas, Susie and I will celebrate 36 years of marriage and ministry together. And um, I don't know how she's done it, but she's traveled millions of miles around the world with me, and I'm so grateful. And I want her to come, take a moment, and greet you, and then we will get into the Word. Make Susie welcome, would you please? Good morning, Fresh Start. Always a pleasure. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. And uh, we uh, are so very thankful for what God is doing here. Can you say amen? amen. We've watched it. It's, uh, we've nurtured this revival with you. And we're revival nurturers, and uh, we're going to keep the flow today. You know Mark and I are missionary evangelists, and we love what we do. And about a year and a half ago, God plucked me up and put me in the Oklahoma District Council as the women's ministry director in addition to, f to following this man. And um, I I'm just thankful for strength and anointing every day. Uh, we can say to the devil, Brother Ryan, I'm not finished. I loved that word. Amen. We're refiring, not retiring. Amen. Wave at me. Amen. He's not done because of a number. But anyway, I feel like all the gifts that we have, I can put now behind missionaries. And I just, you know, 1 Corinthians 3, 8, and 9, I mean, this is just classic word of God here. But after all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. And each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting. It's not important who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. Amen? The one who plants, the one who waters, works together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. So I'm pulling out all the stops. We've got about 200 missionaries that we're behind. Just wrote about a $10,000 check for Christmas offerings. I also launched another Bible study this year. This is on the table, and it's a little... $5 Bible study, every penny of the proceeds goes to support over 200 missionaries. Now, if you can't go, then you water. If you can't plant, then you water. We can't all go, but we can help them go. A $5 book, and then if you'll buy 10 of these, then you can have a free Daughter of the King blanket. And this is a $10 value, so you have to buy 10 of them. But hey, it's Christmas. You can give these little Bible studies. They're 21 day or 21 week. All the great women of the Bible, not the Jezebels, the ones who looked <laughs> tragedy in the face and triumphed. What can we learn from them? What can we imitate? God bless you. We sure love you. Amen. Praise the Lord. 200 missionaries in Oklahoma alone are counting on us, and I believe that God will help us to be a greater blessing than ever before. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, and I want to speak to you on how to reverse the curse. We're going to talk about heaven's court of appeals. And it's very important that you know how to do it because if you don't know how to do it, you'll stay bound, you'll stay sick, you'll stay in lack, you'll, you'll stay tormented and depressed. But if you learn something today, you'll never go back to that place ever again. And I want to show you how 
to do that through the word of God today. Revelation chapter 12, I'm reading verses 9 through 11. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. Say the accuser. Who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Oh, I love that. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Father, thank you for your word. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive. We depend upon the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in these altars as lives will be liberated, transformed, and delivered by the power of God. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. amen. You know, you don't realize when you're growing up in a, in a, a powerful revival Christian home, and our, my parents were not preachers, but they were revivalists. They lived the lifestyle. I watched them live it every day. It wasn't seasonal. It wasn't when just certain guests would come and preach a little fire down that they kind of would uh, link up and get excited about the Lord, but they lived a consistent life of revival every day of my life, and they showed me how to do it. By God's grace, I've tried to emulate their life because they left a pattern for me to follow. It's important, parents, that you leave a pattern for your children to emulate. Not just when you get in here and it's easy to offer a sacrifice of praise when a, a thousand others around you are doing it, but when you leave here and you get home and uh, when someone cuts you off at the intersection on the freeway and your temper wants to soar and when things don't go your way and you feel that old spirit of heaviness, we call it depression, starting to come over you, then, then you've got to know what to do and how to do it and don't just live a seasonal life but a consistent life of revival every day. And so I did not realize what my grandfather, my dad's dad, was teaching me because I grew up in a little town where my grandfather was the judge. And decisions he made affected everybody's destinies. A lot of people loved him because he was a kind, he was a very generous, spirit-filled man, but then there were a lot of other people that did not care for him at all. The judgments that were made maybe didn't go the way they had planned, and so they were not real thrilled with Judge Perky. I'll never forget, as I was the age of many of these children here on the platform this morning, that in the summers, I would go down to the courthouse and I would hang out with my papa for two reasons. First of all, just to be with the greatest man I knew, my papa. And then also to watch him work as a judge, listening to evidence presented, the jury's deliberations, and then the verdict would come. I watched the whole process by laying on the floor, looking under the crack of his door to his chambers, into that courtroom, and I saw it all play out before me. And then also there was another motivation for me being there is that there were dimes lined up on his desk. And he said, if things get a little long, just help yourself, son, to one of the dimes because you know down in the basement of the courthouse there's a pop machine. And can I get a witness for Yahoo Chocolate Pop? <laughs> Yahoo Chocolate Pop was my daily diet in the summer and it will be served at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what I've decreed. So legal matters have always intrigued me. I've seen the defendant stand before the judge and the decision came and tumbled from the lips of the judge and sank deep into the heart of each person in the courtroom. The jury has found you guilty as charged. Then the punishment would be rendered. I hereby sentence you to life imprisonment. I've also heard these drastic words, death by execution. The judge would then pound his gavel against his large oak desk, would resign to his chambers, and the condemned person would stand there in stunned silence as the officials prepared to remove him or her from the courtroom. I've seen them sit down, put their faces in their hands, and, and weep with sobbing sorrow as these words were echoing over and over in their mind and in their heart. You are guilty. You will be imprisoned for life, and some death by execution. But then something always happened that seemed to turn the tables. 
that person being represented, their attorney would lean over to them after even such uh, traumatic sentences, life-altering sentences that would affect the destiny of their life. Their future has now been changed. Their plans have been altered. And they, it, it seems that there's just no, no hope from here. But I always noticed the attorney would lean over and whisper something in their ear and then sit right back. And I saw myself under that cracked door from the judge's chambers, I saw the person who had just been sentenced, who had just been pronounced guilty, I would see them quickly begin to, to wipe their eyes and, and get their act together, and they would sit up straight and tall, and it seemed to me that there was a ray of hope now born into the heart of the accused. How could there be any hope when they are facing what looked to be a, as a hopeless situation? But I noticed it. My grandfather came away from one of those particular trials and he would take his robe and his gavel and, and his uh, books and so forth and papers and I remember he'd put everything up and then he'd sit down and just answer questions that I had. I may have been eight, nine, ten, right through there I remember the most. And he would say, what did you learn today? And I would say, well, Papa, I noticed that after the sentence had been rendered from the jury, even though it was a very, very bad thing, I saw the attorney of the accused say something to them that seemed to kind of lighten the load. What in the world happened there? And he just reared back and he smiled and he said, well, what they're telling their, uh, the person they're representing is they're telling them don't give up yet because we have the ability to file for an appeal. And if that appeal is granted, we're going to have a new jury, we're going to have a new judge, new witnesses are going to testify, and there could be an opportunity for this thing to be overturned or reversed in a higher court. Everybody say a higher court. And all of a sudden, if that uh, uh, appeal is granted, they put together new material. They file for the appeal, and they've got a new trial, a new judge, a new jury. Now this ray of hope truly is born into the heart of the accused. Now there could be possibly one more opportunity to obtain freedom. They even could appeal this to uh, all the way if they, they choose to the Supreme Court of the United States to see what verdict could be rendered. And after a few months transpire, the new trial convenes, new evidence is presented, new witnesses testify, and the jury leaves, and after several hours or days or maybe even weeks in deliberations, they return with the verdict. I've seen the defendant as he or she is asked to approach the bench. They tremble with anticipation. They fight back the fear. Then the judge asks for the verdict. And sometimes, through the process of appeals to a higher court than the original uh, verdict that was rendered, sometimes the verdict is reversed by a higher court. And what I'm here to tell you today is the devil's decision is not the final decision. You have the ability and the privilege to appeal to the higher court of heaven where Jesus, the advocate, He's your legal and spiritual. He's your spiritual representative. He's the one that represents me. Well, how does he represent us? The Bible says that he's before the presence of God ever interceding for his children. He's praying for us right now. He's defending us right now. He's standing in our place right now. And he already satisfied the justice of God and shed his blood on Calvary's cross as he defended us and took away our sins and took upon himself our sicknesses, our diseases, and through 39 stripes placed on his back by his stripes, I am healed and I am whole and I am delivered. The devil's decision is not the final decision. But the devil's gonna pass sentence on you every day if he can. If you don't understand it, he's, here's what he does. He comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. We're all familiar with John 10.10. 10. He's always after your joy, your voice, your health, your peace, your success, your family, your mind. The list is long. Everything God has given you, he's passing sentence. He's going around to God's children always whispering. He's the whisperer. He's the liar 
and the father of lies. There's no truth in him. And when you hear anything uh, diabolically opposed to the word of God, just know who it's from and the origin from where it comes from. It comes straight from hell and it comes straight from the lips of the devil. And so he's always condemning God's children. Always telling us how wicked they are, how we, we don't deserve God's blessing and favor and increase in, in our life and God's anointing and none of these things. Uh, and he's always telling us these things and condemning us for our faults and our shortcomings. He's always telling us we might as well give up. There's no use for you to try to live for God. You're, you're a mess, man. You're a failure. You're guilty. And then he passes the sentence. Here's the lies the Lord showed me. He's been speaking to people in this house. You're always going to have financial trouble. You might as well get used to it. That's just your lot in life. But I'm here to tell you the devil's decision is not the final decision. God wants to bless you in a greater way than you even want to be blessed. And if you'll obey the word of God in your tithes and your offering and your seed, then you have no ability then to be in lack or be without. But you'll have everything you need because he promised he would do it. Here's what he says to others. Here's a lie many of you have been hearing. You're always going to have family trouble. Your family needs to be on the Jerry Springer show. Just admit it. Here's another lie. You're always going to be sick. You've been prayed for dozens of times, and you're still not healed, so you might as well just settle back and settle in because that's just, but that's not the truth. The devil's decision is not the final decision. He paid the ultimate price. And I decree and declare every day in my body, I haven't been sick in 28 years, not one day. Have I missed a service? Have I missed an air, a flight? Have I missed an assignment? I don't understand it because I sure don't eat the way I probably should. I'm hungry now. Pastor took us out to eat last night. We went to a place we could find open because it was late, and we went to, to uh, Chick-fil-A. And I'm standing there looking at this menu, and I'm thinking, that ain't going to work. That's not, the word combo means nothing to me. That's not going to work. And then I looked over Pastor's shoulder, and on the wall was a poster of a 30-count nugget. That's what you'd get like for a football team, you know, or something. And I just looked over Pastor's shoulder and I said, there we go, now we're talking. And it took him a while to get, to get his laughter under control. We, we have a lot of fun together. And so the enemy's always saying you're gonna be sick. It's a sentence that he's trying to pass. He's trying to declare you as guilty and are you here? Then he hears another one. He says to others, you're going to be lonely the rest of your life. Spend it all alone and depressed. The Lord showed me a picture not long ago, and I was excited to bring it to you about this one word. And let me just highlight it quickly. The church is a great battleground where great victories are, are won. This atmosphere is a battleground. And there's conflicts going on in the spirit. And souls are, are um, weighing in the balance. And breakthroughs are depending on pursuit or a lack of pursuit. And all these things are happening in this battleground of revival in the church. But the Lord showed me a picture. There's a, there's a Goliath that keeps walking in. And in many lives, he's not yet been knocked out. Revival service after revival service, weekend after weekend, month after month. And yet in some lives in this building, there's still a Goliath who's roaring and mocking the power of God. And that giant's called depression. America represents 6% of the world's total population, yet we uh, consume 94% of the world's prescription drugs. This nation, not talking about another nation. This giant is a real stronghold in our culture, but also in the church. $80 billion will be spent this year to combat treatment for depression. I'm not talking about those areas that may need some medical attention, but I still believe even then God can break those chains of addiction. And when I start talking about this subject, it gets real quiet because there are so many, as even our own president said, we have a national health crisis in our culture. It's an opioid epidemic. 
It's not just the hard drugs. It's not just the street drugs. But the prescription drugs is what's binding this nation. And many in the church are bound by this giant called Goliath in their lives. I mean, they've got a stone. They've got some stones. They've got a sling. But they still don't know how to knock him out. And this is the season to knock out every giant in your life. To knock out everything that would come against the authority of God. To slay everything that would keep you from what God has for your life. This is that season and this is that moment. Well, the cause of a lot of depression is unrealized dreams. And the devil comes and lies and puts this sentence upon you because he's lying to you saying, you know, you thought the first marriage was going to work. Unrealized dreams. Well, I thought I'd be further along in my life, you know, in my work, in my finances at this point. You would think that, and that unrealized dream. I never dreamed that my kids would grow up and and not serve the Lord. I've loved the Lord all my life with all my heart, yet they don't want to have anything to do with him. Unrealized dreams. I thought I would be up the ladder in my company so much further than I am, I can't even believe where I actually am. Surely this is not God's plan for me, unrealized dreams. And that's the cause of much depression. And the enemy plays on those emotions. And the enemy uses those things to come against you and lies these things and says what I've been explaining to you. Sows these seeds of incarceration, if you will, and sows these seeds of guilt in your life. And so I went to God's word and I found something very powerful. My grandfather taught me that the laws of our land, listen, are based on precedent, on what has happened in the past. I saw him so many times go to his great library and go back and compare a a, a trial uh, that may have taken place years and maybe even decades ago. And he would use legal precedents to apply to a present case because if someone used a certain pattern to obtain pattern to obtain freedom in past legal precedents, then they were able to now take that same pattern and follow it because whoever followed it before saw a great end result. They got what they were after and achieved what they had uh, uh, wanted. And so legal precedence helps ensure that other trials can be conducted in a similar matter, in a similar fashion, uh, to get the desired end result. And so I went to God's Word and found out that God's Word is our spiritual precedence. God's Word gives us records that go way back and shows us how He'll handle the devil's decisions and how to reverse the curse that may be on your life, how to knock out that giant of depression that's trying to hold on to you and not let you go. And uh, he's always uh, uh, showing us that that God uh, can't do this and can't do that, but all I have to do is take my Bible. And I just go and I say, wait a minute, devil, you're such a liar and such a fool because God's word says right here that if I will do this, he'll do that. If I will obey here, then he'll release his hand. If I'm willing to trust him here, he'll come through here for me. And this thing called the walk of faith is not some kind of a stab in the dark that we just hope we kind of get through. I'm not living on Grumble Street next to Gripe Boulevard by Sorry Avenue. I'm a king of the most high. I'm a son of the most high God. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. His name is wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. There is none like him in all the earth. I love him so much. I love him so much. And when I realize that the Bible is filled with spiritual precedents, then you don't have to wring your hands, pace the floor at night, and sip from a mint-flavored Maalox bottle to get you through to morning. And too many Christians live that way. I wish you could travel with us. You'd see one of two things. The churches we're in every week all year are either having a revival or having a funeral. I'm finding no middle ground, Brother Ryan. I don't see anyone in that middle. They're either having a revival and they're in hot pursuit of a spiritual breakthrough 
or they're absolutely in a funeral procession and you can already smell the stink. So when you are a part of something like this, don't you take it for granted. Don't you get comfortable even in it. Don't grow accustomed to, to it. But keep your heart open and keep your, your spirit hungry and keep that thirst upon your lips for, for the things of God because it's not, it's not something that you conjured up in your own ability. This came right from heaven because somebody got on their face and they began to intercede and someone began to pray and someone said, we're not gonna settle for less. We only want the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We want what's pure, we want what's real and we want that thing that will deliver people's lives. So when I found out the laws of, or the spiritual precedent is located in the word God, I just thought, well, let's just go find a few. Let me mention some. Job comes to my mind. The enemy passed sentence on Job. I'm taking this wealthy man out. He funds too many ministries. He's too much of a blessing. And I'm going to take him out. So Satan attacks him. And he attacks him. And Job, you know what it is. It's not a rags to riches story. It's a riches to rags as it appears, and he took everything from him, attacked his life uh, in such a terrible way. His friends and family accused him. His wife even said, you need to just give up and die, man. Why keep on trudging along? Uh, just, just give it up. That's what his own wife encouraged him to do. But the Bible says that Job understood how to appeal to the higher court of heaven because Job with his words said the Lord gave and the Lord took away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And it's your words, it's your words, it's your words that change something. It's your words that reverse it. It's your words that turn it around. And you know what happened? God reversed the devil's decision. He brought Job twice as much as he had ever had before. He turned grief into happiness, poverty into plenty, and sickness into health. But Job had to make a declaration. He had to decree a thing. You can't just sit back and say, well, I know the Lord knows where I am, bless his holy name, and I believe that one day in his timing, and, and if it be his will, he will come and he will help. It's gonna be a long life. It's going to be a long, arduous, painful life. But David comes to my mind. Satan said, I've got to get rid of this one who's about to go to the throne. I've got to take him out early. And uh, so he passed sentence upon David's life. And he sent a bear. But David defeated it. He sent a lion. But then David defeated that. Then on that battlefield on that wonderful day that we all have been taught this lesson if you've been in church, from the time I can remember the great story of David and Goliath. And you know what happened? God gave him favor. God gave him a very prophetic anointing because he said something that day that changed the situation. What were his words? Remember, nine feet six, a sword and a shield that, that each weigh more than David's whole body in total weight. With just one strike of his instrument of war, David is cut in half with not much force behind it. This giant never had lost. And he was mocking God. He was coming against the, the people of God and mocking the, the authority of God. And you know the story. I'm not going to go through all the details. But David steps up to the plate and says this. You come to me with a spear and a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And this day, he will deliver you into my hands. So get ready to go down. You're not coming around here anymore. And you know what happened. You know what happened. But you gotta see, understand that David had to make an appeal. The decision was made that he's going out, but he had to appeal the decision. Daniel comes to my mind and Satan simply said, Daniel's got to go. He's an intercessor. He's shifting atmospheres when he prays. And he's calling those things that are, that, that are not as though they were. And because of him, he's going down. And he launches an attack, and it looks like he's succeeding. He's arrested, and he's thrown into a den of hungry lions. But he, every day, three times a day, even in the most difficult crisis of his life, he would look 
toward God. Come on, somebody. He would start lifting his voice and he would basically say, I'm not going to be dictated to on how I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not even letting these circumstances that I find myself in tell me that I'm finished. I'm not finished. He's not done with me. And he begins to cry out and pray and God turns it around and David makes a pillow out of hungry lions and starts saying, hey, you come over here, shut your mouth, you're ugly anyway. Lay right here, I want to take a nap. And you, you move over there and quit growling at me because you, I take authority over you. And he just took care of business and created a wonderful pit group <laughs> out of hungry lions. Anybody still here? Joseph comes to my mind, Satan decided this dreamer, this dreamer's got to go. And every one of us that God gives us dreams and visions and revelation, he's always going to try to attack your life to take you out from fulfilling those very things that he will use to explode his glory on the scene. Joseph comes along, you know what happened. He, uh, this dreamer, Satan says, you're guilty, and I'm going to take you out. So he devises an elaborate plan, and uh, Joseph is sold by his brothers. His own family turns on him. Doesn't that make you feel great? And uh, those closest to him, you would think, those that would have your back, you would think, don't always depend on your family to follow you when you're serving the Lord. There always comes a time when a revival atmosphere comes when family members can't go with you because you know what? They won't be willing to pay the price. There's going to be people that won't pay this price with you and they could be the closest ones to you. And it's going to be difficult on some of you because decisions will have to be made. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll come to back that one next year. That's a good message. So you know what happened, Joseph appealed to the higher court of heaven every single day until he was released. He thought he had been forgotten, but God had not forgotten him. And as he stayed steady and, and began to appeal to the higher court of heaven, he became a ruler and ended up seeing his own brothers bow at his feet as he was the one that had the power to sustain them, strengthen them, and prosper them, and he did. I see the Hebrew children come to my mind. Satan decided these three have got to die because they will not go along with my idolatry that I've established in the land. I've put strongholds of idolatry all over this land and they will not bow, so therefore they're guilty and I'm taking them out. The elaborate plan was devised and you know what happened? They were arrested because they would not go along with the king's decree to bow to the idol at a certain time of the day when the instruments would start. Everybody had to come out and pay homage to these idols. They said, no, I'm not going to do it. Doesn't please God. It's not right. So we're not going to do it. I love what happened, though, because, yeah, they were arrested. They weren't just arrested and slapped on the wrist. The king was so enraged that he had the furnace that they used for execution heated seven times hotter than ever before. The intensity of the heat killed a guard when he just got the doorway open. Just the intensity of the heat. Seven times hotter, and they threw all three of those boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in that fiery furnace. Are you here? And the Bible says the door was shut. And science will tell you that the intensity of that heat, seven times hotter than before, should have melted flesh from bone in seconds. In seconds. Just incinerated. Just melt off the bone like wax. But the Bible says that when the king went and checked inside to see what was going on, expecting to see these, these leftover bodies being uh, incinerated and melted by this intense heat, he looked in and saw up walking around. There's Shadrach, and over there's Meshach, and over there's Abednego, and over there's Uh-O. And the Bible says that that fourth man that appeared was like as unto the Son of God. God made a quartet out of a trio, and he'll make the difference in your life. And with you and God, you make a majority, because if God be for you, who can be against you? I say, if God be for you, who can be against you? Their hair was not singed. Those ropes that bound them just burned off and fell at their feet. They came out 
and revival struck the land. And those that had been opposed of God began to serve the living God. Revival came. I see Apostle Paul and I see Satan's decision, you're going to die. I'm not going to ever let you get to where you write those prison epistles. I'm going to take you out even before you get to pen these so-called words from God. So say, or Paul even lists in 2 Corinthians Satan decisions. Paul knew what the enemy had launched against him. He said five times I was beaten with 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned once and left for dead. I was shipwrecked three times and spent an entire day and night in the deep. Paul says of his own life, I was in peril, often suffering weariness, pain, hunger, thirst, cold, and nakedness. And all of us have those times or seasons, whatever you want to call them, where we go through difficult moments. Just because I'm in a revival atmosphere doesn't mean that I'm uh, not subject to attack. But I've learned what to do through the attack. That's the only difference. I'm still attacked. When, when, when uh, Apostle Ryan was talking about the instances he has had overseas, the airplane, the engines blowing out, we've been in every one of those situations. And uh, I've learned, though, how to sing my way through. My family gets irritated with me. I'm humming and singing all the time in the car. And when we used to take family vacations, my son and daughter would say, Dad, do we have to do this? I say, I'll be a little quieter, but I've learned how to constantly keep a praise upon my lips. A song always coming out of my heart, out of my mouth, even in the most difficult of times. So Paul began to pen these words, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I've been to that spot 26 times in Rome, Italy, where Paul in that prison was writing these encouraging words as he could hear just up on the ground level, just down the street a short distance, Christians that were being burned alive, Christians that were being made sport of, and, and Christians uh, just like us that were being executed and used for sport for the Roman people in the great Colosseum, and just down the road and undergrounds where he could hear the cries of those children children of God as they were being executed but yet he's writing words of encouragement he's appealing to the higher court and God used him mightily as the greatest apostle I believe that's ever walked the earth and the prison epistles I read them often because they were not written from a five star suite somewhere in Paris these were written in a dungeon in a damp dark place where it was not popular to be and you were, she was chained to Roman guards but yet I see what he wrote and I see how he positioned himself to reverse the devil's decision let me give you one more and then we'll pray 37 years ago coming up next month a decision was rendered against my life some of you know the story I gave it here last in 2005 and uh, but many of you that are new since then which is a big group of you you may just think that uh, it's just been all uh, great for me. But let me tell you where God brought me from, and it might explain why we're where we are. And uh, so I started coughing and uh, started having trouble. I was on a football scholarship at a Division I school. Sacking quarterbacks was my expertise. And uh, even though I was a white boy, I was very quick. <laughs> and I was very mean. Now, not outside of football, it was very kind-hearted, I believe, but when it came to football, I don't know, something just came over me. It was some kind of anointing, <laughs> but I have to tell you, it was a mad anointing. And I had about two seconds or less to get into the backfield and wreak havoc, and that's what I was trained to do, so that's what I did. But all of a sudden, all your dreams, your plans, your pursuit all changed because a cough just started and it got so bad over weeks that I started having a lot of pain in my chest. My lungs felt like they were on fire. I could feel hard rock-like lumps under, the, under my skin, around my neck, under my arms. I remember around my rib cage and around the waistline, these hard lumps you could feel now protruding under the skin. My heart was beating irregularly. 
I ran five miles a day. A strength coach, speed coach was assigned to me to help optimize, you know, your, your talents and do what you're there scholarship to do. And I could not run a flight of stairs without losing my breath. And I used to be able to just do this, you know, a lot. My body was breaking down so fast that, that nobody uh, could even understand it. Puzzling. I went to, I took all the, you know, over-the-counter stuff, you know, you, you, you take this, this will really help your cough. So you'd take that, you know, and it just kept getting worse. So now there's no other recourse. I've got to leave this campus and I've got to go and um, have a physical exam. I did. Word came back a few days later when the phone rang in my parents' home and I was there and I answered it. My doctor said, Mark, I'm sorry. Um, this is not um, the kind of call I wanted to make today. I said, what are you talking about? because I'm thinking they're gonna prescribe something really powerful. And we're gonna take that twice a day for seven days. And, and life will be normal. But he said, we've located several large black masses the size of golf balls that have filled your chest cavity. He said, your lungs look like a man's lungs who have smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day for 20 or 30 years. And I'd never smoked a day in my life. We didn't do that where I grew up because our dad was an all-American dad. He put on stripes, we saw stars. And so <laughs> that was just not an option for the perky boys. <laughs> and so he said, I've taken the, the liberty to have you admitted at St. John's Hospital in Tulsa where two of the finest specialists in this part of the country are awaiting your arrival. I said, when do I need to go after the semester's over, after the season's over? He said, season. He said, they're awaiting your arrival this evening or by morning at the latest. Everything now shuts down. All dreams, all plans, all pursuits are off. I look at my parents and I said, you'll never believe where we're going. I packed the overnight case. I was admitted. Uh, a series, a battery of tests. Some tests were not a problem. Some tests I don't ever want to see again. I was 19 year old, years old in the peak of my life and, and, and physically especially and, and yet your body's breaking down so fast there's not a thing you can do about it. Well of course we prayed, of course we declared, of course we decreed and our family began quickly to move in. It was getting worse. Have you ever done the right things and still you're battling something? That's where your, your faith and your trust in the Lord kicks in because I've got to tell you Maybe somebody else knows a secret I've not yet discovered. And if you've learned one, you tell me. But I've never been able just to snap my spiritual fingers and everything go away the moment I snap. Now, I believe God will bring me victory as he always does. But not every single time I snap or say a certain thing. Sometimes you battle a little while. I don't know why. I don't always want to. It's no fun, I'll tell you. But sometimes, and I was battling I was battling now for my life because the doctors came in on a Wednesday night, met with my parents and myself, and said, we know what we're dealing with. There's several large black masses filling the chest cavity. There's two clusters of this mass attacking the heart and a lung. The doctor said, Mark has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And without a miracle, he looked at my parents and said, he has three to six months to live. This cancer has spread like wildfire. Those were his words. And uh, we signed a, a clipboard giving them permission to do two radical surgeries the next morning. An incision here that I'll have my whole life created a large opening, go inside, remove a lot of cancerous mass that was the upper portion of the chest cavity and, and have send some of this, of course, to pathology and get that red and, and, and so forth. And then the second surgery was one we dreaded. Only the chief surgeon of St. John's Hospital could perform it. He was only one of two doctors at that time that was qualified to perform it, an incision that would start here, and the incision would wrap all the way around to the other side. They were gonna open me up on my right side, break some of the ribs here, and go in and start an 11-hour surgery of going after cancerous mass attacking vital organs because their words were we have to do everything we can radiation or chemotherapy were not on the table because it's too late for both that's where we were I'm doing the math and the doctor walked out of the room and I thought without a miracle I'll never see my 20th birthday and boy did I have plans of course I was not in the will of God at the time I was not 
backslidden in the sense of not serving the Lord, but when it came to obeying the Lord on his call on my life, I was in disobedience to that. And so I'm just telling you how it was, just being honest with you. I was serving the Lord, but yet I knew he had called me. I can take you to the place where I was nine years old, where under the power of the Holy Ghost on a ground outside of an open-air tabernacle with grass-gravel mixture, he called Mark Perky to preach. I can take you to the spot. It's still there. But yet I was running from the call of God. I'm like, Lord, I'll serve you. I don't want to live any other way. I'm going to serve you. But maybe you could find someone else more qualified. I'm not your man. And how many times have I felt unqualified? And so doctor said, this is what we're going to do. Give us permission to do it. My parents said, we're going to try everything we can. Three to six months to live. They signed it. I kissed my parents goodbye. And um, that night, though, I called someone who knew how to appeal. I called my mamma. Don't mess with Holy Ghost filled mammals. Don't mess with them. They'll hurt you. They will hurt you. Boy, I miss her. I miss her even now because when I'm in church, I think about her. And I loved it when we would eat over at her house after service on Sunday when it was time to go to her house. When she'd come in, in that pretty dress and those pearls she always wore around her neck and those pearl matching earrings and that hair was done from Friday's due, Friday's appointment. And she'd come in, and, I, and I'm thinking, we're eating at Mammoth. Let's go find out what we're having. I never had to ask. I would just hug her and sniff. And I could smell chicken grease and Estee Lauder mixing itself together right there on that spot. And I knew then, we're having fried chicken. We're having collard greens. We're having cornbread and fried potatoes. Come on, somebody. I'm so hungry right now. I'm left-handed. I just got to preach food for just a moment. I've got that 30-nugget count on the wall at Chick-fil-A. That picture's forever in my mind. I've got it right now. It was only $15. And so watch $15 if you can get full. Oh, boy, I miss her. But I called her. I did her funeral at the age of 100. And uh, after I hired a band to a funeral, if you knew her, you better have a band. (laughs) I had a Hammond B3, a piano, bass, lead, and drums. And we started kicking that old school Pentecostal stuff that we do on a Sunday night out of the Red Book. And I'm telling you, we'd change keys five times so somebody would finally get happy and say, whoo, and then we knew something might happen. We might actually break through, you know, once Sister Shundai would Shundai, you know, and once Brother Yay Yay I Say would say something, then we might have a breakthrough. Well, I'm having fun. Let me enjoy myself. I laugh about 50% of my life. The other 50% is ministry and but if you don't laugh, you're in trouble. Boy, if you don't have any joy, you won't last long in this thing. Devil will eat you up if you can't have the joy of the Lord that is your strength. Well, let me wrap it up. And uh, she, I called her. I said, I need you to pray. She said, I'll see you in the morning. Didn't want to visit. She hung up on me, actually. I wasn't even through talking. <laughs> hung up on me. These kind of mammals, they don't want to uh, uh, yak, as we say, very long. And so she started praying at 11 o'clock that night because I called her just before 11. I interviewed her, and here's what she said. I, pray, I started praying at 11, walking in my house, began to pray for victory and healing over your body. I said, what else happened? She said, oh, I can tell you, it's time flies when you're having fun. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, when I finished praying, she said, I, I did something I'd never done before. I took the family Bible that was on the coffee table, and I put it out in the middle of the living room floor. And I flipped it over to Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed. And I walked over there, she said, and I stood on top of it. She was in her middle 70s at the time. And she said, I stood on that Bible, and then in her words, I had a time. Some of you know. You can't really put words to that. And I said, what, did you pray for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, standing in that kind of a... She said, when I finished praying, Mark, she said, I put the Bible back on the table, went in the kitchen. It was 6 in the morning. For seven hours, 
I'd been standing on that Bible. And she said, I knew I got to quickly get ready. You're probably already going to be gone and taken for surgery. I won't even get to see you and tell you. But what she didn't know is while she's praying specific prayers, the presence of the Lord came in my hospital room. I sat up and looked at that wall there at the foot of the bed where I knew the presence of the Lord was, and I could feel the presence of the Lord along that wall. I couldn't see it. I strained to see it, but I felt it. I knew where it was but could not see it. Came along the left side of the bed, up to the foot of the bed, along the right side like this. And then after some time, I got the courage to reach out and try to touch what I was feeling. So I cried out and called out on the name of Jesus and I reached out here to my left and I tried to touch what I knew was right here. I couldn't touch anything. I didn't know what was going on. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to be touching something? Where is my faith? You know, all these things swimming through your mind. Something wrong with me. He's here. I can't seem to connect. What's the problem? But he wasn't there for me to touch him. He came to touch me. And a few moments later... I felt up to the head of the bed, my right shoulder, the Lord spoke to my heart about my calling. And I said, Lord, if you're that desperate, I, I'm always using humor. I said, if you're that desperate that you want me, you really must be in need. <laughs> he probably didn't find it funny, but it helped me. <laughs> and I said, here I am, Lord. I'll do anything you want me to do. That was the greatest miracle, actually, for me personally. But then I felt a hand drop on my chest. And I looked up quickly to see what staff member had slipped into the room and there was no one yet in the room. And yet I felt the details of a right hand. For some reason, it was a palm, the, uh, the heel, the palm, the fingers, the thumb pressing on my chest. It was a few short seconds. It was warm to the touch. The presence of the Lord left the room just as it had just entered. And then I fell asleep with peace. When I'm awakened, it wasn't long. I'm awakened, it's time to start getting prepped. They give you a sheet, do this, 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 and this. And uh, so I'm getting prepped for surgery, getting ready. Everybody you would expect to be there is there. And then we're going down the hall. We're being taken to the operating room. And I hear this voice, hold on a minute. He's mine. And I looked up at those two male nurses that were taking me down. I said, that's my mamma. You need to go ahead and stop now. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to be a blessing to you, sir, and you, sir. I don't want to see you whipped right here. But she's Cherokee Indian. She's Native American. This woman will hurt you. Stop right now. And they said, okay. They stopped and stepped around. Of course, I was just teasing, but they believed me, and that was great. And so she came up to the bed. No one knew of anything. I said nothing about my experience, she said nothing. She comes over to the bed and she says, I want to know if the Lord did what I asked him to do. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I've been with him all night. And I could see dentures as far as the eye could see. <laughs> and to save money, she would soak her dentures in a coffee mug with Clorox and water. <laughs> so my mamma had Clorox breath. Every revival night, every Sunday. She'd kiss me and I'd just think, Clorox. She'd sugar me again, Clorox, Clorox, Clorox. There should be a song written about the anointing of Clorox. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No one told her you could go to Walmart and buy something, you drop and it fizzes, you know. You, no one told her that. She'd, she'd fill up water, drop a little Clorox in there, put those dentures in there. The, the whitest smile without laser whitening. No whitening toothpaste, no trays, no goop, nothing. Just sparkle. This was for you, Ron. This was just for you, my brother. <laughs> this is for my brother. And she said, I've been with him all night. And she said, I just want to know if he did what I asked him to do. I said, what are you talking about? She said, I asked the Lord. Notice the order of someone who knew how to appeal. The devil had cast his sentence. He was going to take me out, and I would never fulfill the call of God on my life. But what happened was she said, I asked the Lord to fill your room with his presence. She said, I just need a yes or a no. And I said, he didn't. She said, I asked the Lord to walk around your bed and minister to you and deal with your heart about your future. And when a mamma wants an answer, they pooch their lips. <laughs> and then they wait on you. You have to respond. After the lips are pooched, you better say something worthy. <laughs> and I said, he did. And she said, good. And her lips went back in. I was okay. 
And she said, I asked the Lord to lay his right hand on you that was nailed to the cross for you. And she said, I asked him to touch you like this. And she put that little light brown skinned hand on me, white hair. She put that on me. And she said, did he touch you like this? Now I'm in tears. She's in tears. Things are making sense now. And she said, that's all I need to know. And I'm going to go join the others. And uh, I said, just like that. She said, good. Like no big deal. I'm like, aren't we going to dance right here or do something? She just said, good. And she just started walking away, praying in tongues. When she got down to the waiting room, my dad, my dad's mother, my dad said that Mamma took over. She said, no weeping around here. Oh, no. She said, I just, I just talked to him. And the Lord, we hadn't seen any results yet, but it doesn't matter. You already know what's going to happen because you've stood on the word of God and you've declared and decreed it to be so. And then you realize that if God said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. And she knew how to appeal to a higher court of heaven. And when she launched her appeal, God came down and he touched my life. And the first surgery was performed and the large opening was created. They went inside to start the long, tedious process. The chief surgeon is waiting nearby to start the second surgery, but they didn't need a second surgery because in the first surgery, they swept this chest cavity from top to bottom, side to side, and no cancer could be found or seen anywhere. And they sent me back to my room. And when I got back there, I heard a mammal singing. A lot of you don't know the songs. If I start singing and you say, where'd that come from? But she starts singing, oh, I want to see him look up on his face. There to sing forever. I, just, just help me here. Come on. Oh, she said, on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Oh, I, well, she changed keys in the waiting room. <laughs> Mammals don't change keys. But they were rejoicing when I came out of that anesthesia. I had a whisper because of this surgery. I was swollen for some time. And in my whisper, I asked my dad, who was standing over me, and I said, what happened? He told me. I had no voice to express it, but the tears just seemed to roll hard. And then I whispered to my dad, would you be disappointed in me if I would forego this full ride football scholarship to go to Bible college? I just thought this is not the thing to ask, you know. And yet he whispered back to me with a kiss. And he said, son, while you were in surgery, I gave a school my credit card. They're waiting on you. <laughs> Stand to your feet with me. Lift your hands and begin to make your appeal to the higher court of heaven right now. Come on. The devil's decision is not the final decision in your family. His decision is not the final decision in your finances. His decision is not the final decision in your body. Today, he's going to bring healing. He's going to bring strength. He's going to bring help. He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. That's what he does. That's what he does. If you're in this service, say, Mark, I need the Lord to reverse something. There's something that's holding on to me. There's something that's plaguing me. There's something to me that I haven't been able to shake and I need the Lord's help. I want you to come quickly and fill this altar with me. We're gonna pray together. Come on, come on, come on. I need the Lord to turn something around. I need something to be reversed. I need something to be reversed. I'm speaking to people who have been depressed. That spirit of heaviness has been on you and it's time to cast it out. It's time to get rid of it. It's time to slay that giant right where he stands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands and your voice. You start making the appeal. I'm not going to make the appeal for you. You do it. It's your privilege. It's your privilege to come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy in your time of need. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your voice. God's given you a voice we heard about last night. Use it. Use it. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Make your appeal. 
Make your appeal. Put your confidence in the Lord. Declare his name and his power and his blood over that circumstance. Hallelujah. Turn it around, God. Reverse this curse. Reverse the devil's decision. I am not guilty. I'm a child of the king. I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a victor, not a victim. I'm the overcomer, not the one being overcome. Come on, declare that now. Declare it now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray for some folks. Come on, just lift your hands. Lift your hands. Come on, praise the Lord, somebody. Appeal, appeal. The higher court is waiting for you. Let the shadows head tonight. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Make your appeal. Make your appeal. Come on, make your appeal to the higher Lord. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Come on, make your appeal. Lift your voice. Lift your voice and shout unto God right now, somebody. Come on, shout unto God. Tonight, your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Shadows get tonight. Your day cannot be overcome. Your day is alive, forever lifted high. Your day cannot be overcome. Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble. Jesus. Somebody shout, turn it around. Come on, turn it around. You make the darkness. Come on, somebody shout it out. Turn it around. Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence me. Jesus, Jesus. Somebody shout, turn it around. Jesus, I can't hear you. Come on, turn it around. Make your appeal.
want you to declare this with me and I want pastor to come say this with me the devil's decision is not the final decision I will appeal and it will be overturned it will be reversed by the king of kings and the lord of lords who is interceding for me now now give the lord your best shout for that right now come on Shout now! Shout now! Wow, what a word today, amen? I've heard that many that testimony many times, but it's just like it always gets me. Great miracles. I just feel this. Great miracles are within reach. They're not far away. For you that have been believing for you, that have been fighting for you, that have been scraping, it's not far away. See, that is the lie of the enemy. That tells you it's so far away you're never going to grasp it. For for a child of God, it's never over until you win till you receive the promise and I've just felt and I didn't know Mark was going to share that maybe because he's like I said he shared here you know I guess you said the last time was 05 and obviously 05 was a was a pivotal point for me because that's when I had my accident But I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this because I, as your pastor, Pastor Kim and I, we need you to press with us for miracles. I believe there's, there's a generation called the millennials that before they care how we frame our gospel, before they care how we declare our gospel they're going to want to see it demonstrated before articulated and so we need people like Mima, those that have that faith with grit in it that will stand on the word of God and believe I believe for your miracle today. John, I believe for your miracle, son. I believe for it. We need to believe for miracles for one another. Anyway, God's touching me today. He's been touching me all weekend. For you, for, for, for y'all that have missed this weekend, you, you miss being touched by God. I don't know what to tell you. But we're going to come back here tonight. And Apostle Ryan, God's going to use him in a powerful way as he's been doing. I think he's going to release impartation and pray. And, and it's going to be a, a powerful evening. If you did not see the fulfillment of your, your miracle, you didn't maybe sense the, 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 the healing. If I was you, you couldn't keep me away from here tonight. I don't get that. If you want it, you're going to have to go after it. Don't Remember what Mark said? You can sit there and wait all day. Quit waiting and start walking toward it. Miracles are coming to this house in an unprecedented manner. I said miracles are coming to this house in an unprecedented manner. I'm talking about undeniable, undeniable, notable miracles that cannot be mocked, that cannot be disputed, but they will have a voice to speak for themselves. Miracles are coming to this house because miracles are coming to your house. 
Somebody shout, yeah!